first play that Undermain took to New York and we went to the uh, Ice Factory Festival and produced it in the summer of 1999, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I still have the I still have the great poster. <laughs> yeah, I do too. But I actually met you all when you were producing Eric Eng's play, um, the his Sound and adaptation the Fury. of Faulkner. Yeah, the Sound and the Fury. Right. which was an amazing, I flew down to see that when I was working at Classic Stage Company and in the city. And That's that right. was an amazing production. It was really astonishing. So, and Coaticook, I was so pleased with the production you all did of Coaticook as well. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> no, uh, that's, thank you for reminding me. I was, I was back in the, I was like, how did, where did we originally meet? And yes, now I remember it was during The Sound and the Fury. Um, and so that was, uh, Coata Cook was uh, produced at, uh, as I said, the Ohio Theater. Mm -hmm. And that's also where we met your husband, Robert Lyons, who is the uh, longtime artistic director of the Ohio Theater, now the new Ohio Theater in their new location. You all were in uh, Soho when, um, which where you know we performed that and a couple of other plays over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and you had that wonderful, you had a whole floor of that building as your living quarters. Mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, one of those remarkable things, an old New York story that doesn't exist anymore. Um, Robert ran the theater and um, the landlord gave us that floor as his office. Uh, we weren't legally living there, but <laughs> we were living there for 18 years. Um, you know, the landlord knew we were there, but you know, it was part of my husband's job that we got to live there. So that was a, um, I don't think those experiences happen anymore in New York City, but it yeah. was a really good one when it, while it existed. Yeah, yeah, that was such a great space. And the old Ohio was such a great space too, but yes, you know, the demands of the marketplace took over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, tell me a little more about your, um, you know, your early work as a painter and do you still paint? Um, I have, uh, no, I don't still paint. I still have canvases. I think about, I'm spending time up in upstate New York during the pandemic. And I th keep thinking about taking up painting again, but I actually haven't had a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I haven't done that yet. Uh, and don't know that I will. Really, I, I stopped painting um, because after about a year in New York, I didn't know what I had to say as a painter. I wasn't sure, um, you know, I, I, I had the urge to paint and, and I still think um, I had tendencies, you know, you can see that it's one of my paintings, <laughs> but I, I, I didn't know um, how to, what I was expressing except, you know, my feelings through color. Um, and it's when I started doing performance where you use language and imagery and the body that I really found my metier. I mean, it's through, performance, uh, solo performance initially, and uh, I've also directed large group spectacles. And then from there um, became more of a playwright um, that I really found my voice. So um, even though imagery, imagery uh, has always been a strong component of my work and is an important component of my work, language has become, language is the, the um, 
element that I think is most powerfully expressive for me. Right. And you know, Catherine was, uh, that was really her point of interest was lang language driven work, as she would say. So let's talk a little you, bit about- You all have done remarkable, have produced remarkable writers. I mean, I think it's, you know, some of, you're one of the, in my opinion, um, outstanding theaters in the country in terms of the the writers you've chosen to produce. They are language based writers. Yes. For the most part. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to um, stay on that track, you know, now. Um, but I, I'm wondering, in a way, if uh, so. I guess I guess you first met Catherine on that trip. Uh, to Texas. To see Sound of the Sound of the Fury. And then you all kept in touch. And I know we would, uh, even though, I mean, we produced at the Ohio several times, as I said, and we would always uh, stay in touch. But what were the, um, the beginnings or the genesis of how you both got interested in Simone Weil? Well, for me, I was interested in Simone Weil uh, when I was much younger, um, you know, when I was in my 30s. And um, I read, I had, when Catherine asked me to do this, I had already four Simone Weil books in my possession. I had uh, Gravity and Grace and Waiting for God, which are two of the compilations of her writing that were um, done after her death. Uh, she wrote, oh, voluminous amounts, but she didn't actually publish uh, a book. It's after her death that people collected her notebooks, uh, edited them, uh, found her writings and, uh, Camus got Gallimard, uh, the big publisher in France, to do 14 volumes of her work. So um, other people became very, um, once they discovered her work um, or once they refound her work, um, were adamant about it being published. So I had those two books and then um, a friend of hers who also went to um, Kanye with her, the preparation for university, um, Simone Petromont, also a philosopher, uh, wrote a book called Simone Weil, A Life, which is kind of the definitive. It has everything in it, everything in the kitchen sink. Um, it, it feels like she just put everything in there. Uh, it's a personal book. It includes a lot of Simone's writing, excerpts from it. Uh, it's about a thousand pages. Um, so that's, that's, it's probably 800 pages, but it's, it's a huge tome. <laughs> and um, I had that book. I had not read it all until uh, preparing for writing the play. So Catherine um, actually did approach you with the idea of writing a play about Simone Weil. Oh, she did. So, Catherine, um, I met, I saw, well, I've seen Catherine off and on over the years, and she has always been supportive. One thing also, another thing we did is she took photographs of me um, back in 2000. Um, and one of the photographs she took is on my website still. It's it's still, you know, and and um, I used it for promoting um, uh, one of my solos. Uh, and she had come up to the city. Well, you guys have a place in um, in Queens. Yes. And so she was up there and she came to the garden party benefit for um, the new Ohio. And uh, I saw her and, you know, we started talking and she said right away, 
she said she wanted me to sit down with her and she told me she had this idea for a pay, play about Simone Bay and she wanted me to write it if I was interested. And of course I uh, had been passionate about Simone Bay myself. And um, so I was very interested. And then she came to stay here um, about, it's hard to tell now, is it two years ago, three years ago? That's I guess. right. It was during it was the summer of 2000, 2018, I think. Right. She came to stay here and um, we started uh, tossing ideas back and forth and um, talking about what interested us in, in Simone Bay. And um, one of the things that is in the play, I mean, Kat is in the play in a way, um, is that she started reading her when she was taking care of her father for two years. So I think that's really significant because one of the things um, that's important in her thinking is uh, the importance of attention and how r rare it is that we really give our attention to people who are suffering um, and how it requires setting the self aside a bit in order to focus on the humanity of that person. Um, Simone Weil from what a young age was really interested in uh, justice and in people who were, um, who had less, people who were doing without. And I think it's also significant that she lived, you know, during World War I to World War II, you know, that period was a period where Europe and France, people did do with that. When she was five, she wouldn't eat sugar because the soldiers at the front didn't have any or couldn't have any, you know, didn't have it. Um, so from a young age, she had this sense of justice and what you have to do for people with less. Um, and she got very, she was a political activist as a young woman uh, and, and not never a communist. She was not interested in dogmatic solutions. She was interested in um, working people coming up with their own solutions and sort of um, would demonstrate with them and join them and gave, even once she was teaching, she would spend her weekends going to a town several hours away to give free classes to workers because she thought education was so important that everybody deserved the right or the possibility of thinking freely and being sufficiently educated to, to participate in the life of the mind. Um, her brother was, she had an older brother and she was, um, he was brilliant. His name was Andre. He became a, a famous mathematician. Um, and he taught her uh, a lot of what he knew, um, both, you know, from Greek and Sanskrit to physics and geometry. Um, and she, struggled with learning more than he did. I mean, everything seemed to just come to him and she really had to work at it. Um, so she felt she wasn't sufficiently smart, but uh, she was first in her entrance exam to the Sorbonne. Um, she, was, she went to university at a time when very few women were able to. Um, Simone de Beauvoir was in her class. 
um, and she was second on the. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she was second. Wow. Um, and um, she said, Simone de Beauvoir, this is in the play too, that Simone de Beauvoir says that she um, envied Simone by the, um, the ability to feel for people on the other side of the world because um, she had cried when she heard about people starving in China. Um, but Simone, well, anyway, she had, I'm not gonna tell you the whole play, but anyway, uh, she did, uh, eventually, after not being after being involved in political things, she volunteered for the um, in Spain during the Civil War there, and was disillusioned. Thought that even that that wrongs were done by both sides. That when you go to war and you're fighting, you um, lose sight of what you're fighting for, of the very, um, um, you, it's no longer as clear. Um, and so she started moving away from uh, political engagement. She did work in a factory because she wanted to know what workers experienced. Um, she was very clumsy all her life. Um, in Spain, she stepped in boiling oil before uh, an engagement with the enemy <laughs> and had to be sent away. Um, and in the factory, she would burn and cut her hands. Um, but she wanted to have this experience, even though it wasn't her, her talent was not a physical talent. It was an intellectual one and, and a spiritual, emotional one. Um, and she's, she started moving more towards um, spiritual engagement. And that's one of the things that Kat was really interested in and that I was really interested in. Um, are these the, the writings that she had in Waiting for God and in uh, Gravity and Grace? They're, they're full of contradiction and they're kind of, um, they t bring you up short because sometimes it's exactly not what you would think, but it makes you think. She had very complex, she could deal with contradiction and paradox. And she was interested in the dialectic. And so she was interested in, in ideas that, you know, you looked at it this way and then you looked at it totally the other way. And somehow you had to find uh, a way to hold those two things right. um, together. Anyway, I'm kind of going on and on, oh, but I really do find her fascinating. So. Yeah, and she was, um, what would you say? Um, she was multifaceted. She could be, you could consider her a, an economist in some ways or uh, someone who wrote, well. Wrote well, she wrote, she wrote about um, politics. She wrote about um, physics. She right. wrote about she math. She was a philosopher. And philosopher. She was a mystic. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot. Rolled, that's a lot in that package there. Yeah. Yeah. She majored in philosophy at university yeah mm -hmm. right but and she was she was self-taught she could read sanskrit she could read greek um and wow. she read lots of things in their original language oh i didn't know that that's amazing mm -hmm. i mean to teach yourself sanskrit uh boy you got to be <laughs> you have to be kind of a genius there i think and really disciplined which mm -hmm. she was well wow. And, um, and as you mentioned, um, part of the thing that I, I suppose attracted Catherine was this mystic aspect, but more so, um, like you say, Catherine was, uh, she was, 
helping her father through a lengthy hospital stay and a transition into a, um, you know, a, a life kind of with assisted living and everything. And um, so Vile or Vi, I'm not sure the exact, is, is it Vi in French? Um, I've heard it both ways. And so I, I, far be it for me to tell you definitively. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so Vi had um, a, an interest in, as you mentioned, suffering and attention to those suffering. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, and this is what makes her, her kind of a difficult character. I mean, uh, you read her her writing and she's obviously a brilliant, uh, an inspired person, but she also had this interest in the physical breakdown of the body mm -hmm. and in a way that she actually began to physicalize a lot of this. I mean, she had issues with um, food, uh, yeah. you know, and so I think, you know. Uh, Francine Duplexis Gray has a book, um, a Penguin book, which, you know, I think is a good one to pick up. And it's, it's a quick read, but it's very interesting. Uh, it's called Simone Weil. And, um, she emphasizes that um, Simone had difficulty, um, well, at the end of her life when she died, one of the doctors said it was of starvation. She had tuberculosis, but one of the doctors believes that if she had eaten what he said for her to eat, that she could have survived, um, but she was adamant all her life about not eating more than, like it, while she was in England, which is where she died, um, she wouldn't eat more than uh, people could eat in France. And uh, people wanted, at one point in the hospital, they wanted her to drink milk and she said, children need the milk. Um, so, so there, and she did have trouble, you know, her mother says in the, uh, that she only ate the, the best food that anything else disgusted her. Um, but there's, when you read about the mother, the mother kind of probably instilled some of these ideas in Simone, who knows? Um, but she was particular at a certain point and then she, she'd she forget about eating, she smoked a lot. She probably smoked more than she ate at a certain point. Um, but it's when she worked in the factory that she said it was the first time she experienced true hunger, the kind that hurt when you walked. Oh. Um, so, and that's because she, you were paid by the piece and she was not good. And so she couldn't get, didn't get paid enough to buy enough food um, when she was working in the factory. Um, but she did believe that the body, she didn't really like her body or trust her body because her body, would just get her in trouble all the time. You know, like when she'd step in the oil or when she, her hands um, were always, they weren't flexible. She, she worked hard. Everybody says that when she worked in the fields that she was a super hard worker. She wasn't, she wasn't a gifted worker physically, but she had that, that's mental strength to make the effort. But she did think the body got in the way of um, the spirit. And also the body was a source of pain for her. She had horrible headaches. I mean, I think the equivalent of migraines. 
um, and they were excruciating. And so the body for her was not necessarily a place of pleasure or, um, you know, uh, where she felt strong. And so I think she, she did feel at the end of her life when she was in New York, um, she wrote this kind of terrifying prayer saying that she hoped to become, um, you know, to lose con control of her body um, and essentially to become food for, to become food for others, you know, for others suffering people. Um, and she felt somehow that, that um, I mean, this is not something I understand or admire about her or, uh, but I know that when I read it, I thought about my own mother who, who died of Alzheimer's and how what she was describing that she hoped happened to her is kind of what happened to my own mother and who was a very religious person in the, in the spiritual sense. And so I saw how um, it could, what sounded like a horrible thing could be just, uh, if we see it happening to people we know, that it somehow can suggest a way for the spirit to be going through. You know, it's, it's yeah. like, this is falling away for the spirit to rise. And that's really kind of, um, uh, I think what Vile was, was after. Of course she wanted, she was very interested in Catholicism or in the sacraments, but she didn't want to become a Catholic because she didn't want, she didn't believe her place was ever inside an institution or inside a dogma. Yeah. She felt that her place was to be critical of the institution, but to admire and, and um, not admire, but to re venerate the, the sacraments themselves, you know. So it was complicated. I mean, it was interesting to go to France to... Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that because your research took you, um, you got... The South, yeah, she... France she to go to, go to uh, Provence and do some research there. Yeah, I mean, she, she was, you know, she loved Paris and lived in Paris um, and, you know, live near Saint Michel, near live near the university area, um, and I was there part of the time. But for the most part, I was in Minerve, which is in Provence, and um, she did go down to Provence uh, after um, the Germans occupied came in to occupy Paris. Um, they left on a train that was full. They didn't even go home to pack anything. They just walked to the train station. It was already full, but her father was a doctor and they convinced the conductor that he was the doctor for the train. And so they got on the train and took, um, got out of Paris. The Germans came the next day. And you know, this is a Jewish family. Um, and so it's really good that they got out, but then the Germans were coming where they ended up. And so they started walking south um, to get to Vichy, the Vichy area, to get to Provence. And um, they bought some baskets so they would look like peasants, <laughs> which I'm sure they did not. I'm sure it didn't work. Yeah. But anyway, uh, a guy with a, truck stopped and they paid him to drive them south. So, cause the father had brought, at least had money on him. So um, they got to the south and she really wanted to join the resistance. 
I mean, this is a woman who was really frail, really kind of thin, really awkward. Um, and she had this idea that she wanted to be parachuted in, in behind enemy lines. And, you know, um, she wanted to contribute to the liberation of France. But until she could do that, she thought, well, I'll work in the fields. You know, I'll work um, on a farm. And so she went to this area of Provence Loubron, and that's where I was. Um, I, I stayed at the Maison d'Oramar, which is this wonderful villa that was Picasso's breakup gift to Dora Mar. It's this um, beautiful villa in this, in this little mountain town. Um, and it was bought by a Texan, a woman named Nancy Negley uh, of the Brown Foundation. And um, to apply to go to Dora Mar, you, it's through the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. That's, that's how you apply. Um, so it was wonderful to be there in this place surrounded by Dora Mar's photographs and paintings and um, reproductions of them. Um, and I also went to an abbey nearby, which kind of inspired me of, for this um, place where um, Simone Weil had decided to, she, she went to work for a farmer, but she thought it was too luxurious to stay in the farmhouse. <laughs> so she insisted they find a less luxurious place for her to stay. Right, so this is she, in play. I remember this, yeah. Yeah, so she stayed in this hut that used to be, you know, that was abandoned, essentially. They kind of like cleared it out and she cleaned it up and she, um, it was on a river. And so she was really happy there. She said it was like being in a Grimm's fairy tale. Um, and there wasn't that much work for her to do. So she learned Greek, the, the Our Father in Greek with Thibault, the guy whose farm it was. And he's the, one of the men who collected her writing later for publication. Um, but it was, I, I found a place that really reminded me of that hut where she lived. And, and it, you know, I was able to write from, from that spot. Um, it was an amazing experience and being there. And also in, in that area, they have this idea that cicadas are um, the, the spirits can go, you know, cicadas, they go to, they sleep for a long time and then they come back to life in the spring uh, every few years. And um, they believe that it's part of the transmission of the soul through the cicada. Um, and I had an experience with one in my room that is part of part of the play, but I'm not going to tell you about that. No, yeah, that's a beautiful uh, story in the play. But let's talk for a few minutes about the play itself. Um, um, I would say so. Lenora has created the play as a dialogue between two characters, one named Catherine and one named Nora, mm -hmm. and also um, Simone by herself. So mm -hmm. um, it's a fascinating way to explore the subject because it's really sort of like you and Catherine exploring mm -hmm. your, your ideas about Simone Weil. Yeah, and there are things, you know, there are a lot of things that Catherine had um, told me and notes that I had, um, but there are so many questions. Okay, I don't think, I didn't even know she was ill. And I found out from a friend of mine that she had died. 
And, and all I could think of was the, how many questions I still had to ask her, you know, things that I wanted to know about why a black and white floor, checked floor, why, you know, there were things that, that she had said she could see that I wanted to know why she saw those things. And, and, and because, you know, Bruce is going to direct it and I'm thrilled, but she was going to direct it. So I knew that she had certain um, ideas in mind or images in mind that, you know, and it took a while before my own images took over, you know, and that's what I have to go with is my own images because I can't, you know, and with Bruce, I can talk with Bruce, but we can't find out what, <laughs> what Catherine's, you know, um, right. idea was. Yeah, but I did I bring, know, I brought, I brought Lenora a, a, no, that, that, a notebook that Catherine had put together about Simone and I left that with you last fall, I guess it's been. It's been so helpful. Having that notebook has been so helpful. And the section from Shakespeare that's in the play is was in Catherine's notebook. You know, it was a longer section in her notebook, but I just have a few lines. Um, but it's the perfect ending to the discussion about the Iliad is, is Shakespeare's lines on mercy. So um, I, I don't know, I might, I, I hope I'm not being too specific, like you guys don't know the play, so it, it, please, if you have questions, um, you know, if yeah. I can clarify anything, let me know. Because... Let me also just point out that the play also contains a lot of imagery and um, uh, video projection, um, music uh so it's uh it's very multi sort of disciplinary but uh, i think it's it's gonna be it's a, it's a rich do a rich do of things um but i i mean i'm hoping that it that it carries that it has some truth or some intersection. I think it does with what Catherine saw in her, you know, but yeah. also with what, I mean, the question in the play for, for Nora, the character Nora, is um, Catherine's fascination with Simone. And and in a way, Simone at a certain point tells Catherine, you were able to do uh, what I wasn't able to do. Um, anyway, you'll find that out or not. <laughs> I assume you'll see it at some point or hear it. Um, and for me, there's this fascination with Simone Vai, but also a kind of rejection of her too, because I think she goes very far. Um, we live in such a secular world and yet her spirituality is both uplifting and also so rigorous. There's no, um, you know, she doesn't, You know, somebody brought her a roast chicken during the war and she wouldn't eat it because, you know, other people couldn't have a roast chicken. Um, that's a kind of, it's a kind of rigor that's almost rigid. <laughs> and so I think that, that she's both, um, I guess it's around food that I don't get her because I really like food. I'm from Louisiana, I like to eat. <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, but she's admirable. She's admirable and also kind of 
I don't know, frightening to me. So it's been interesting to go into this, you know, and uh, explore it and try to be uh, just and fair, but also try to find the part of her, which I don't think I've landed on yet, the part of her that was fun and, you know, people found her really irresistible. Um, but it wasn't charm. It was something else. It was her quality of reasoning or her something, right. her passion, because yeah. yeah. she was that. Well, um, so maybe we should open up to see if people have some questions they'd like to ask either about the play or Lenora or our plans to play. I mean, is anyone curious? I see there's one question that I think we've kind of talked about asking about um, if we can describe Catherine's character in the play. And I have to say, it really is it's Catherine. I mean, it's Catherine as Catherine, I would say. You know, uh, Lenora's done wonderful things in the play, like we don't really want to give away too much, but so Catherine will be doing things during the course of the play that she used to do, like she would do beadwork mm -hmm. and she, she, of course, was drawing and painting and all the time. And so some of that, uh, happens in the play too but I mean yeah so I think because someone is asking can you describe her character and well you know I mean she's she's the one she's the one who drives the she's driving the inquiry into Simon I mean she's the one who knows about you know she's telling Nora things she's teaching Nora things or uh, you know exp uh justifying Simone to Nora, uh, explaining Simone to, to Nora, but also um, she talks about her own and she directs their, Nora and Catherine uh, act out certain characters in Simone's life with Simone and Catherine directs that. You know, she she plays a role, but she also d directs Nora, directs, you know, tells her what to do. Um, so I think she's she's a, a sympathetic character. I mean, I think she's a really, I think oh, Nora's okay. a little bit of a, a joker or a, um, I mean, she's not, Nora is not me, um, but she has some aspects of me, but she's more of a, a skeptic or a joker. Um, and Catherine is a more um, kind of visionary focused uh, character. Yes. And I see somebody's also asking, uh, Deborah Sutton is asking uh, our plan. And so uh, as you all know, I mean, we were gonna do uh, the reading last spring, you know, we were going to do it as a staged reading. We were going to try to add some video elements and music so that it was a little bit more than just a reading. But here we are uh, in this uh, so far unabated uh, COVID era. And so I kind of think we'll probably end up with a virtual uh, sort of reading in the spring. I, I don't know that we'll really be able to have people down at the theater until maybe the summer or next fall. So I think the reading will end up Depends being- Depends on that vaccine, Bruce. I know, but they, you know that? <laughs> That vaccine is a two-part vaccine. So they have to, they have to uh, manufacture and distribute like 660 million vials of this vaccine. Uh, and you know, I just don't think everyone's going to be able to 
get I don't think we'll be in the theater so. right away. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, so I think what we're we're probably looking at for this spring is a reading that is a virtual uh, streamed experience that uh, we may we'll probably put it together remotely. And but I think we're going to try to add the music and some of the visual elements um, as we can. And then our broader plan for the play is that we'll do a fully staged workshop production in the 28th season, probably in the spring of the 28th season, which by that time, I think we will be past this uh, and so that's kind of the trajectory of the play as far as Undermain, uh, you know, producing it. So we'll be with the play for a little while and developing Meanwhile, it. Meanwhile, I, I have been revising it. Um, I know it, we were supposed to do the reading in May and I did another revision in July. Um, and there are a couple more places I want to look at. So I'm you know, it's not sitting in a drawer. I'm still looking at it, trying to um, make it better, you know. I, and you I, know, I was gonna offer, last night as we were talking, I thought that um, we can put together uh, a reading via Zoom just for you and me and the, the actresses involved so that you're probably at a point where it would be great. It would to be really helpful. Play. You know. It would be really helpful because you can hear what is not working or hear what is working when you hear it read, you know. And also actors contribute so much to a playwright's process because they can say, they can ask really excellent questions that where you can see where you need to do something or they can... Um, bring something to life. I, ju I just find once you have the actors read it, it's a, it's a really important step. Yes, I agree. Um, so that would be great if it happened. Yeah, yeah let's, uh, I'll, I'll keep on that and we'll uh, find a time that will work. Um, Among your million and other, uh, and one other things <laughs> yeah, that well, you have to do for the theater. Yeah. Now, what, I know that uh, my husband is is uh, has a theater, as as um, Bruce said, and uh, he says that it's even more work to keep a theater closed than to keep it open. <laughs> I mean, they're doing online productions. Yes. Uh, but it's you can't do things face to face. So everything, it's always on phone calls or Zoom or, you know, okay. so it's a lot of work, uh, this pandemic, you know, yeah. to keep things going. Plus, as we all try to pivot and create these streaming uh, productions, I mean, we've got a lot of other, just to uh, assemble people to film something, we have a very stringent uh, protocol we have to follow and we have to get tested. We have to, oh, wow. you know, everybody has to have their temperature taken. We have to maintain all this, the distance and uh, we can only have a few people at a time in the uh, space. So it just takes a lot of extra planning and, uh, you know, and trying to reconfigure the season multiple times, which I think we're just about ready to announce uh, what our season in 2021 will consist of. Uh, so yeah, we're getting there. Bruce, you had shared a, an image with me. Did you still wanna share that? Yeah, if we could, we'll just, this yeah. is uh, the sketch or slight painting that Catherine, it's one of the th paintings she did of Simone Vai. Uh, it's from Catherine's notebook and actually I don't know if you can see like the writing 
that's over it, that's from waiting for God. That's, and it's in French. So Catherine would often copy things in French. She spoke French and she, in order to kind of keep uh, flexing that muscle, she would read in French, she would write in French. And so here is Catherine's impression of Simone and over it is the, the beginning, the opening uh, text from her, I don't know if it's an essay or what you would uh, describe it as, but waiting for God. Yeah. It's hard to read in um, online, but it's yeah. a reflection on the good something. It's hard for me to read it. Yeah, it's but, hard. Uh, it's a JPEG file, so it's kind of uh, mm -hmm. digitized, the uh, writing. But the image is really uh, very like Simone Weil. Yeah, very much like her. And she has, Catherine had beautiful handwriting. Yeah, she, she worked at that. I... <laughs> You know, I've tried, I'm trying to uh, call upon my inner cat so that I can do more handwritten notes. <laughs> and she was always writing letters and paying very close attention to her handwriting. And my handwriting looks kind of like uh, a wild animal that somehow <laughs> human clothes and is trying to write. <laughs> I'm trying to refine it. That's an absolutely lovely picture, uh, portrait. Yes. And with the with the writing, it's just a, a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. As we're used to with Catherine, she she was remarkable as an artist. Yeah, and we had this. This was hanging in the. Uh, um, the collection of things, of paintings that we were showing uh, last season. Mm -hmm. So we'll probably make that available again when we're presenting uh, Feeding on Light. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's a quotation from her. She, she talked, there was uh, some phrase some sentence that ended with feeding on light. And I just thought, oh, that's so apropos for her, I think, because light and dark were really important. Um, she, she had certain tropes that showed up again and again, and that was one of them. Any other questions? You don't have to have any. <laughs> Well, all right, it's been a, a fascinating discussion and I wanna welcome Lenora uh, back to the Undermain. And I know we're all gonna enjoy um, interacting with her and working on Feeding on Light, so. I look forward to meeting people in person. I hope we can do that in 2022, if not 21, so. Me too. We're itching to get back to a little bit of uh, socializing. <laughs> but in the meantime, this is a good way to see everybody. It's so wonderful to see you all. Uh, and unless anybody has any uh, last question, I guess um, we'll wish you all a good evening. And thank you so much for being involved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Oh, and dear. thank you all for making me the first. Hear the play. Can't wait. Thank you. Very excited. Oh, good. <laughs> Stay healthy, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us. We appreciate Lenora, Bruce, and each one of you so much. So thank you, and we'll be in touch with more events and more plans as we as we finalize them. So. Have a lovely ev evening and a lovely week and we'll see you at the next one. <laughs>